Hi guys, welcome to the video. So you've just built your hot wire CNC foam cutter and it's not working, or it's not working as you expected. I get quite a few calls, uh, emails and YouTube comments from guys that are having some issues and usually they're just simple issues that are quite easy to fix. So in this video, what we're gonna do is cover some of the troubleshooting issues. And I also get quite a lot of questions as well. Um, you know, guys have already got their machines working, but they, you know, they come up with questions, you know, uh, sort of like, what tension do I use on the spring and uh, how much current do I use on the wire, them sort of things. So after I've covered the troubleshooting, what we're gonna do is cover uh, some questions as well. So I hope you find it interesting. And so without further ado, let's get straight into it. So as I said, I get quite a few emails from people having problems with getting their machines working. And, and if you're fairly new to this, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And when it doesn't work, you know, it can be quite disappointing. So what I thought I'd do is cover some of the most common problems that uh, people contact me about, and we'll just work through them. And hopefully by the end of it, if your machine isn't working, it should, should be working at the end of it, or you know where to start looking. And if all else fails, just uh, contact me, send me some details of, you know, your setup, some pictures and the, uh, possibly a video, and I'll take a look as well. So we'll start off with probably the most common issue I get called about, and that's the one of the axes is not working, or all of the axes are not working. So it can be caused by a few different things. So let's uh, let's make a start on the first one. So the first thing to make sure is that you've got enough power for the ramps board. Um, the USB cable that goes in the side it just isn't enough to power power this board with all the drivers on there. So if you're using um, motors rated about one and a half amps, so you've got four of them, so that's six amps. The ramps board itself takes about an amp, so that's seven amps. So if you if we multiply that by twelve, we get eighty four watts. So you're going to need a minimum of an eighty four watt power supply, but pro probably more is better. Even um, these little wall adapters that you can get that sometimes provide about five amps, so even, even that's going to be pushing it a bit. So what you really need is, is something like this, a, a proper power supply. This is actually a 24 volt one, but the 12 volt ones are identical really, apart from the alti. So, and the other thing you can use as well, it, if you've got one laying around and you can actually use a computer power supply it needs a little bit of a modifications to make it work but um, quite a few people on 3d printers have used that to power a 3d printer and basically we've got the same setup here as a 3d printer so uh, that's another option you know if you're trying to keep the cost down so so let's look at what can be some of the common issues so one of the common issues we, we get these drivers on here sometimes you can get a faulty one and i think that's generally why they provide you with five but there, there's five slots there but it's not very often that the fifth slots use so what you can do so what i'll suggest first of all if you're finding just one of the axes isn't working just get your spare driver out and just swap your driver and see if that fixes the issue the other thing to do is where the cables uh, connect up, I haven't got a spare one to show you at the moment, but where the, where the cables connect up, let's just zoom in a little bit. So what else you can do is just swap the cables around on the, where the stepper motors connect up. Um, I haven't got any connected at the moment, but just swap them around and see if you can identify which axis that the fault is coming from. So that generally identifies usually a, a faulty driver. I've had quite a few guys that have had uh, faulty drivers. So these things are only a couple of uh, dollars or a couple of pounds each. So uh, you know they're, they're made to a price. So I suppose the chances of getting a faulty one is quite common. So swap the drivers around to start with if that doesn't fix your issue. The other thing to do is make sure that you've matched the the drivers to the stepper motors. The drivers I've got in, in this ramp board here are the, uh, the A4988s and then 
on the actual uh, build on the on the website and on the video part two the electronics I'm using using the DRV eight eight two five so they can handle slightly different amounts of current so on the electronics build you set a voltage reference there's a little trim pot on each of the each of the drivers there and we set that with a voltage ref what we basically do is we set the voltage reference to match the stepper motor and, and the driver so I'll put an example up on the screen but say we were using say we were using the NEMA 17 rated at 1.2 amps with the DR8825 drives we would set the voltage reference on that to 0.6 of a volt so it's on that driver it's it's half the current but if you're using the A4988 the calculation is a little bit different as you can see and so we would actually set that to slightly more so I've had one or two guys said that when they've upped the current they um, found that the motors work so it's probably they haven't match the actual uh, current from the driver to the motor so that's another thing to check and I'll put your reference up to a uh, so I think it's called P P P P P Polo I don't think I've pronounced that right but I'll put that up for you that's where I'll get all my information to do with drivers it's it, they've got a real good um, section there showing all the different drivers and how to calculate the actual voltage reference some of the earlier um, a49 uh, a8s the ref voltage reference was cal calculated slightly differently so, so just just double check which which versions you've got of the a49 a8 so if you bought them a long time ago you might have the older versions but more recent ones it's the, it's a calculation that I've put up on the screen that should work fine so check your voltage references and make sure you've got enough current going to the motor to turn them and then as I said, just uh, try swapping the motors around. It's it's quite rare to get a problem with a motor, but what is quite common is to ha is to get the wiring uh, wrong. Um, I've had one or two guys, so when they've swapped the wires around, um, it started working. And um, what you need is the pairs. The pairs are connected. Uh, so on the actual board itself, we've got. Let me just have a look here. See what? Yeah, we've got. 1A, 1B, uh, 2A and 2B. So they relate to the pairs on the motor. And on this, let me just get a... So this is this is an EMA 23, obviously a lot bigger motor, and it's four wires. So for the stepper motor to work, we've got coils inside and so these coils have to be wired up correctly. So if you if you don't have the wires correct, you can then <laughs> you'll find that they won't work properly. A simple way to check, and I'll show this later on as well. If you just join two of the wires together, you can feel a lot of resistance there, and you might be able to hear it as well. Let me just put it close to the microphone. So that tells you that's a pair. Now, if I join it with one of the others, there's no, it just turns very easily there and you can't feel any resistance. So if I turn that up, you, you can't hear anything there and you can feel it. So that's a simple way to, to check for, you've got pairs. So it might be that it possibly, I'm not, I've had one guy say to me that was a problem that um, the, the motor came wired incorrectly. So that's another possible cause why one axis won't work. So hopefully that should get you through any problems with axes is not working. Now if all of them are not working, it's, it's, it can be uh, related to the actual Arduino and the ramps board. So what we'll do on the next bit, we'll cover how to check them. Something else to double check as well is to make sure you've got the, the actual drivers in correctly so if you look on the driver get this up close here see if you can see it focus here 
So if you look on the driver, there's a there's a pin there called EN for enable. It's actually labeled enable on this one. And on the ramps board, yeah, just on that, just on that pin there. So, so make sure you've got the driver lined up correctly so they line up. Um, I would imagine probably if you put them in the wrong way, it will probably blow the drivers. Um, so, so that's a good reason to have a, have a spare one. So I had one or two guys as well that had faulty ramps boards. Um, some of them have tried a slightly different ramps board. You can get some all in one where the Arduino and the ramps board are in one, I think they're called M MKS boards. And the whole thing is built as one unit. Um, and I've had one guy, guy try that, but he found it was faulty. Um, so he went back to using this setup. Not saying there's anything, anything wrong with them, but uh, he was probably just unlucky to get one that didn't, didn't work properly. Um, so it's possible it might be a faulty ramps board. So the, the next thing to do is to check that the actual Arduino uh, is working and you've got the code uploaded okay. So what we'll do, we'll just unplug the Arduino at the moment. Because what I'm gonna do is just unplug the ramps board. So the next thing to confirm really is that you've got a good Arduino board. And most of the these ones, are, like I've got here, are actually Chinese clone. So this isn't a genuine Arduino board. So if, if you if you can, then I would probably say, you know, do get the genuine one. Uh, probably the next time I buy one, I will buy a, um, a genuine one. I've had no problems with both boards, but, you know, because they're built to a price, you know, the, sometimes the quality of the parts isn't always the best. So what we want to do first of all is make sure that we've got the firmware uploaded correctly. So we plug in there. So I've had one or two guys have had problems uploading the firmware. And the reason you can get that is, right, we'll bring up the Arduino. And right, and one of the issues, and I've done it myself a few times as well, is when you go to upload the firmware, <clears throat> wherever you've extracted the firmware from, so if you download the firmware from the website, just extract it somewhere. So I've got mine on. So I've extracted it there. And the thing to do is don't load this up as a library like you do on some Arduino uh, firmwares. All we need to do is find the INO file and it's got the little Arduino icon on there and just double click on that and that will load the Arduino up. No, we don't need a new version. We'll just close that one down so we haven't got two runs. So the, so the next issue that comes along, and I said I've done this myself a few times, if we go on to tools and then we go down to board, make sure you've got the correct board set. set. Um, Cause I do a fair bit with 3D printing as well. I sometimes upgrade the firmware on the printer using the uh, Arduino and I have it set to the wrong, wrong board in here. And then I go to try and upload this and you get an error. So I'll just, I'll just show you the the problem you'll likely to get. I'll select, I'll select the wrong board just to show you what's going to happen. We'll select the nano, which is a tiny little thing. So if I go to oh, the, the other thing to do as well, just make sure you've got the right your port selected okay. So as you can see down this little error message you've got at the bottom port A was not declared in this scope. And what that, that's, that's specific to the Mega, uh, the Arduino Mega 2560. So the Nano hasn't got that. So that's, that can sometimes trip you up. So just make sure you've got the right board selected. So I'll go back to the genuine Mega or Mega 2560. And on the processor, 
we want the 80 mega 2560. I think the 2560 signifies it's got a bit more memory in here. I think it's 256k memory, whereas the 80 mega 1280 has probably only got 128k memory. So make sure you've got them selected correctly. And then you, you've got, you're connected to a serial port. And then if we just do an upload, And while we've got the sort of amber light on the arrow there, it's it's working. So first thing it does, it compiles and then it goes and uploads. There we go. So it's gone back the same colour, so it's uploading now. So if you want to confirm that it's it's worked okay, go on to tools serial monitor make sure you've got the port selected previously and just make sure you've got the got the board right there on the uh, 115200 you see it's already put some messages out but what you can do if you just type dollar dollar let's expand that let's expand that out a bit so you can see all the settings there We'll just clear the output and do that again. So that shows you all the settings on the Arduino. So that so that proves that we've been able to upload it okay. If you're still having problems with that and you think you've got a faulty Arduino board, a simple thing to try. If you go into examples and go on to basics, and there's a thing there called blink. This is a simple blink sketch. And what it will do, it will make one of these LEDs blink. So that will just confirm that the actual Arduino is okay. So if we just upload that, and it won't take very long to upload this one. And you can see now it's actually, so the LED there is actually blinking. So that confirms that you've got a good um, Arduino. So we'll just uh, come out of that. Another problem that you might have as well, uh, it tends mainly to be on Windows 7 and the older computers. The There were some issues with the drivers that were used on here to connect to the serial ports. So if you go into Device Manager on either Windows 10 or uh, Windows 7. Just expand that out. And if we go down to ports, we've got USB serial, CH340. Sometimes it's because it hasn't got that driver and you can do a search for that driver, just download it for the old version of Windows and put that in. There was also a problem with some of the earlier ones as well you might still get the problem with which was which ran a a, um, a driver uh, a chip match manufactured by a company called ftdi i think and there was some issues over copyright with that so microsoft removed or put some some something in win windows that would, wouldn't let it use that driver so you, you could load up the driver switch off come back again and it would disappear um, but they all seem to have gone to using this CH340 driver now. So if you've got like the warning triangle there where the in device manager, uh, it's probably because you haven't got the, the CH340 driver. And if you just do a search online, you'll, you'll, you'll find that pretty easy. I think Windows 10, Windows 10 um, has got that driver built in anyway. So I, th I think that should sort of cover most of the issues you're likely to get with um, drivers uh, not not working or the actual drivers on the Arduino board and the thing to do is just try and isolate where the problem is by swapping cables around swapping drivers around and generally you'll, you'll get to the bottom of it um, if all else fails as I said just drop me some details uh, either via comments on the YouTube or drop me an email and then uh, I'll take a look and see what I can come up with. 
So, so what we do now is we move on to another uh, couple of common issues that we, we get as well. So another common problem I get quite a few emails about is that the, the you've built your machine, all working fine, but the only problem is one of the axes or few of the axes are going the wrong way. So, so there's two ways we can fix that. The probably the simplest way to do it is to do it on the actual stepper motor itself, or we can do it within the firmware, which takes a little bit more figuring out, but it's still doable. So. What I've got here is I've, I've mocked up a, a motor uh, using the ramps board in the Arduino, but because I haven't got any more NEMA 17s uh, kicking around, I've just got some NEMA 23s. I've basically just wired this in exactly the same on the x-axis using uh, a driver for the uh, NEMA uh, 23, and it's using a different power supply, so that's a 24 volt power supply as well. So it it's going to simulate it just the same. So what we need to do is reverse one of the pairs of wires. So on, on this here, you can see the wires are just bare, but on the majority of NEMA 17s you get, you get the little plastic connector. So all we need to do is just prise up the connectors and I'll put a picture in to show you and you can be just swap two, two of the wires around, but you need to find out what, what the pairs are. So if you've got bare wires, and I've had a few guys um, contact me saying they've got some salvage motors from old uh, printers and plotting machines that, that are suitable, but they haven't got any connectors on, so you know, how do we know what the pairs are? So the simplest way to find out the pairs on a motor, even without using a multimeter, is just to connect two of the wires together and then spin the motor. So if we spin the motor there, it doesn't feel any different. Now, if we try one of the other wires and just hold them together, I don't know whether you can hear that. Let me get closer to the microphone. You can actually feel there's resistance there. And it's because it, it, it's effectively working like a magnet. So we know that those two are a pair. And if we do the same on the red and the blue, hold them together, we get the same. So all we need to do, and it doesn't matter which pair you do, where they're connected, all we need to do is swap them round. So I've got a little setup here to show you how that would work. So if we power on. Let's check you can see the motor from the motor a bit more into view. So if we connect there we go there. So if I press the X positive, because I've only got the X wide in at the moment, we can see we're going anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. Right. So what I'll do is I'll just disconnect the power to the motor, let that decay out. And what I'm going to do here is on this driver there, I'm just going to swap two of the wires over. So that one wasn't in very well, that one. So if I now plug that in the, right, so the black was in the outer one. So if we now go for the inner connector. This isn't a permanent setup, this is just for demonstration purposes. Right, so we put the power back onto the 
driver. So now, with any luck, when I press uh, X positive, we should go clockwise. And there we are. So that's one way to do it. So I'm just homing it now. So on the NEMA 17 you buy with the little connectors on, what you can normally do is just get the, uh, lift the tabs up on the wires and just pull them out and swap them over. And that's probably the simplest way, if it is going the wrong way, to fix it. The other way to do it, and we'll go back onto the laptop. If we go into settings, and on this $7 setting here, we can change that. So if I change that to, I've already worked these out. <laughs> Basically what we've got, we've got this, this binary value here. And, and it works at the, the end one there is Z. And then these last bits up here, um, bits five, six, and seven, because this is bit zero. These are for the, uh, uh, the X, Y, and Z. So I think this is, is this you? I can't, I, I can't remember offhand anyway. But, but if I now change this to 65, you just press enter so it's accepted and we don't even have to restart. So if I do an X positive now, we should go anti-clockwise. There we go. And if I go back and change that back to 97 and hit enter. And go X positive again. So we're now going anti clockwise. So that's the other way to do it. So it just depends really which way you want to do it. Um, the only thing you've got to do then is work out what the value is. So there's quite a few online binary uh, calculators you can go on and you can just put the, the values into there and then put it, put that value in and, and you can try it. So, uh, so that's, that's how to fix if the axis is going the wrong way. So the other way to find the pairs of the wires is to use a multimeter and just set it on to continuity mode. So on this meter here, I just set it to continuity mode there. Just touch them together and we get a beep there. So we just go on the green and the red. There's nothing. So if we pull up the black see we've got continuity there and just to prove it we'll check the other two so we've got the red and the blue there so that's it. that's the other way you can identify the pairs there is a there is another option you you might want to try as well on most uh stepper motors they'll, they'll normally have some marking on what they are so let's see if we can see if it will focus on on that there there's some some markings at the top there and if you just google google that number quite often you'll get a data sheet and it will give you all the connections and quite often you'll get the color coding for the pairs as well so th that's another method of finding the pairs you know if you can't um, if you can't find it any other way so so that's that's another way of doing it and sometimes you do get six wire motors and um, quite often you can use the six wire motors as well 
I think you just, all you basically do is one of the wires is a middle tap on the coils and you just don't connect that, you just leave it. So you're just using the ends of the coils. Um, but most of the motors we use these days are a four wire bipolar um, and these are big heavy NEMA 23. So um, good motors, but we don't need them for the foam cutter. Right, so this is one of the common problems I get requests to help with and it's really to do with old laptops with um, lower screen resolutions so I've got an old laptop here so this used to be my father-in-law's laptop and he gave it to me some time ago because um, he wasn't using it anymore but unfortunately just recently he's, uh, he's been a victim of the coronavirus so you know, a little bit of a sad time at the moment but you know, he was 92 and he had a good life up till then so this is a common problem we we get with older laptops usually running um, Windows 7 as well so I'll just show you what the problem is um, now this laptop I think is probably well over 10 years old probably even a bit more so it's to do with the controller program so as you can see there we've got no uh, connect or rescan buttons they disappeared and I think the reason for it is this actual program was um, was developed in about 2015 and I, I don't think the program was built to account for the resolution. Now if, if we just have a look at the resolution on display settings, if you go down it, it normally comes because of this display resolution here 136 by 768. So if you're running that screen resolution, um, you, you get this problem. Now, there is a way to fix it. And what we need to do is if we go into, so we just open it up again. We just come out of it first. So what we need to do is we need to go to wherever you've got the program installed. Go on to the executable program here, so the GRB or hotwirecontroller.exe, right click and then go on to properties and then on the compatibility tab there's a setting here, run this program in compatibility mode. Now it seems to work on either Windows 8 or Windows 7 OK. Uh, I've tried it on both and on this old laptop it's, it seems to be okay. So what we need to do, I'll put it into Windows 8 at the moment and then we apply that. Now there'll still be a slight issue. So we'll start it up. And as you can see just in the corner there we're just starting to get a little bit of the buttons that are missing there so we're almost there so let's come out of it again and there's something else we can do to fix it so if we set the taskbar at the bottom here to auto hide so if we go on to right mouse properties taskbar settings and then automatically hide the taskbar in desktop mode so if we put that on now come out of that and if we now start the program up so as you can see now we've got the connect and rescan buttons now so that's one way to fix it there is another option you can use as well if you go into settings and if for some reason you still can't get them if you go into settings there's an option there call connect on load you can tick that and then what will happen is it will automatically connect um, which is okay but it's uh, I think it's much better if you can connect and disconnect through these settings here so so that that's how to fix the problem with the buttons not showing on the uh, on the controller program so if you've been struggling with that one I hope that one helps you out guys because I do get quite a few requests about that one 
So another common thing I get uh, called about is jelly cut. And um, the issue that people report is, is the display looks weird and all the numbers look small. So I'll just show you what it is and then you can, uh, I'll show you how to fix it. So what we'll do first of all is we'll bring up Jelly Cut. I can find it. So I've, I've done a whole tutorial on Jelly Cut and how to use it. And um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I'll just upload a file I've done already. Uh, so let's have a look at this one. This one will do. So this is this is jelly cut. Once you've gone through all the design uh, process, uh, what you do then is you get, then go to the cut menu there. Um, when you press the cut menu, it generates the G code file. So we we'll just do that. That's it done. You don't get any other information. So if we go and find the file, and I know where they the files are. Put on my drive because I've set it. So this is the file that Jelly Cuts just created for us. Let's just expand that out. And if you have a look in here, all the numbers are very small. And the, the, the sort of um, question people come up with is, well, I'm trying to build a wing with 300 millimeter root, and all the numbers are really small. There's nothing like it in there. The reason for that is the jelly cut works in incremental mode. So, and at the top there, this setting here where it says distance mode, G91 means incremental. So, if we load up the controller program, just expand that. Uh, if we connect to the we connect to the controller it's not that no motors connected but it will still it will still work like just the same it's like a simulation there so so we're connected there so if we now load the file that we just created and if you look at the display there it looks very strange if you just use jelly cut to start with you'll probably find to start with it will load in and you'll get some errors. Now I've, I've done a posting on the website of what you need to do to fix uh, Jelly Cut. It's got some uh, G codes in the header section that the this controller doesn't uh, doesn't like. So on the go to tools options, we go to G code. In the static header there, uh, really all we want there is that G ninety four in there. I think that just tells it to. Uh, the feed's calculated in feed, feed per minute. So if you're having problems with errors in the G-code, uh, have a look on the website. I'll put a link in to where that is. But just get rid of everything there apart from G94. And then that should load in OK and run. So, so what happens is it looks strange, but it does actually work OK. So if we start to run it, so we go to run. So it'll start running through the G code OK. And I don't know what you can see there, just on the screen there, it started to go a little bit red there with the actual path it's creating. Um, the actual controller program um, doesn't, in the, the display, the actual program, program itself sends the codes off to the firmware and the firmware understands incremental mode, so that's why it works OK but the display here doesn't understand incremental mode. So that's why we get this funny display at the beginning. And what will happen eventually, it will generate uh, an error for on both, on both the XY and the U, UZ view. So I'll put you a picture in the one I've done already. I'm not gonna let this run all the way through because it will take a long time. Uh, but so th the main thing is if, if the display looks funny with Jetty Cut, don't worry about it. it. It works okay, and I have cut um, a few wings like this, and it's it's worked no problem at all. So yeah, don't worry about the funny display. So 
So if you have that problem, I hope that's uh, cleared that one up for you. So another couple of issues that come up now, again, somebody will email me with a problem and I'll say to them, well, have a look in the Arduino code around about line 270. And then they'll come back and say, I haven't got any line numbers on. So it, it may sound quite trivial, but if you're not, uh, if you haven't done a lot of this type of thing before, it, 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 it can be something that can be very frustrating. So if we load up the Arduino, I'll show you how to get the line numbers on. And I think they're already on online. <laughs> So if we go to File, in Preferences, there's a little tick box there on Display Numbers. So if we take that off, see we've got no line numbers there. So if I said, uh, I had a guy contact me and I think I said to him, look around about line 270, which is near the bottom there, but if you haven't got line numbers on, it's, it's not easy. So if we just go back to Preferences, and stick the line number on and then we've got our line numbers there so there we are around about line 270 that's where most of the settings are for this this controller so if you've been struggling with that one I hope that one helps you out so one question I get quite a lot and it's probably guys that haven't built a machine yet they wanted to get some information about how big a wing they can build and I've had this question from the very early days in theory <laughs> it's there, there isn't a limit because the two towers are separated so they're not actually joined together. Now I've seen some people build machines where they're, they're using linear rails and uh, 3D printed parts and they look awesome but they have a fixed um, distance so you are a bit limited on what, what you can make with that whereas this machine you can move these towers as far apart as you like within reason well, I'll, I'll discuss that in a, in a minute um, but the other beauty of this setup as well you can move the towers quite close together and the reason you want to do that is if you want to start to make fuselages using dev fuzz foam software and I'll put a link in to the um, two planes I've made uh, fuselages for the Hawker Hurricane and the uh, T-45 Goshawk or the BAE Hawk and the uh, what you need then you tend to need the towers closer together because you there's a lot more travel on on the vertical axis and when you've got them further apart you haven't got much distance for the wire to move so on my machine here I've got a distance of about 750 millimeter or about 29 and a half inches and you might think well that's the biggest wing I can make um, but it isn't actually because by using a few tricks in software we, we can actually make a bigger wing so if you just want to make a straight wing you know something like a, a Lancaster or something like that then you are going to be limited by the distance you put your towers apart but you can move the towers much further apart um, here they're quite close together really for doing wings um, I have, had them, I have had them set as far apart as a thousand millimetres um, and generally the sort of planes that I'm building I, I don't build anything much bigger than that because you know as you can see in my small little workshop area I don't have a great deal of space to you know keep some uh, you know some real big planes as much as I'd like one but you know you've got to be practical about it because swept wings is a little bit of a challenge as well because what happens is let's just get an example wing here so with a swept wing, we've got a lot more travel on the root than the tip. So when that's in the foam cutter, like that, this towel will only have to move up to here, but this towel is going to have to move right up to here with the wire. And the further apart it is, the, you know, the worse it gets. But what we can do in software, um, and you can either do this with software like uh, Dev Wing Foam, or I've got a post on the, um, so I've got a video on 
YouTube about using Jelly Cut to create a swept wing. I'm going to show you how manually to work out what we're going to do is turn the wing so that it aligns the trailing edge. So instead of these being parallel with the towers, what we do, and the way I normally do it, is I turn the wing that way. And so when it comes out, so this is, this is still, although it's black, it's the same stuff. So what happens when the wing comes out, you see it comes out like that and the towers don't have to move very far so you can make a much bigger wing than you think but the only the only caveat with that side of things is that you have to then so these are the same wings but as you can see there we've got to trim off the the root and tip And in my last video doing dev wing foam, I'll show you how I do that. So um, doing it that way, you can make a much, much bigger swept back wing. So you're not really limited by the size of the machine. And what I found as well, when you have got them a lot further apart, the, the wire can tend to get a little bit of vibration in it. So you can get a little bit of a ripple in, in, the, in the cut. So in theory you can push the towers as far as part as you like but in practice it doesn't really work that well so on the actual travel on this machine I've got about 750 millimeters there and I think that's about 400 there so the actual travel isn't quite that much but when you're doing wings you don't need as much up to, up and down but you you need more on the horizontal now I have got a, um, a design I'm going to be doing soon and I can't quite get the travel on it, but the beauty of this design, because we're using cheap uh, threaded rods, this is a longer threaded rod, so when I go to do that design, I'll just swap these, these rods over, and that will give me more travel, and these, these slides will come right out here. So I've, I've done that before, and, uh, and that works fairly well. So uh, That's, that's the benefit of this design. It's quite flexible. You're not sort of fixed to um, you know, what, what you can do with it. So what, what you can do as well, you can use the, the ramps board on connector D8. Just, let me see that there. Uh, and, and you can plug your two wires into there. And then on the controller, there's an option uh, to put some voltage in it there and, then, and that will generate the current for the wire. But what I found is it, it's, personally I found it doesn't work very well. Uh, it's okay, but I found it's either too hot or um, not hot enough. Uh, and there's not much fine adjustment between it. So what I, what I use now, and you've probably seen this in my other videos, I use my eye charger and I've got this so I'll just get this connected up. So I use my eye charger, which has got a, a foam cut option on there. And on this piece of wire here, that's 750 millimeters long, I find for cutting this type of foam, this, um, just, it's just normal polystyrene, although this is, is, is black. It's the same as the white stuff. And I find on using this this wire here, I I need about 2.2 amps, and this is constant current. What I found with the design is it it works better if you supply constant current to the wire. And I think on the ramps board, what it's doing it's 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 providing the PWM signal, you know, pulse width modulation and. Um, it just doesn't seem to work work as well, you know, on the on the hot wire. All I do then is I just set the set the wire going. And as you can see there, what it's doing is the the current and the voltages are going up and then 
what what will happen is the current will stabilize and then you'll see the voltages go up and down just to maintain a, the current and get some scrap foam as well so once it's up to temperature 2.2 and it's showing about seven volts there so if we just and we see the wires just dropping through through the foam now well you can see the foam just dropping through the wire now so the eye charge is quite expensive um, when I bought mine I, I think I paid around about 100 pounds for it so it's probably about 140 dollars something like that um, they are good but they're quite a lot of money but what you can use if you've got a normal uh, lipo charger so I've got this Turnergy one as well with a an ICAD option and if you set this around about two amps um, it will and I have tried it doing that and, and it does work but you just got to be a little bit careful because I've heard reports of some guys doing that and what happens is the charger cuts out after a, a, I think it must have like a, a, a time of uh, you know I think they were saying about 15 minutes after 15 minutes it was it was just stopping and starting again which is if you're using it for foam cutting that's just going to ruin your cut so that's one option you can use. Another option a few guys have used, they've actually bought um, bench power supplies, uh, constant current bench power supplies, where they can adjust the current and the voltage. And, um, and I th think they're quite cheap as well. And, um, and just this morning, um, a, a, a guy called Ian has uh, said he's seen um, one of these uh, buck power supplies on eBay, um, which is, supplies up to five amps and you can adjust it for constant uh, current so he's going to uh, keep me updated on how, how that goes and uh, if it looks a viable solution then you know that might be something else to consider as well so that's power supplies the other thing i get questions about as well is on the spring um, how much tension do i need on the spring you don't need very much. I mean, as you can see here, there's very little tension on that spring. And the spring's actually on the side there. It runs down through an eyelet there um, because I haven't got a great deal of distance there. So the spring's actually up there. So once you've got the the current right for the type of foam you're using, then you don't need a lot of tension on the spring. Now, if you can see the spring dragging, it means you've either got it the speed too fast or you haven't got enough current. So it, it does take a little bit of time uh, testing to work out what's, what's the best combination for the wire you use and the foam. Another question I get is what type of wire do I use? Now this wire here uh, was given to me some time ago by a friend and it's called Litz wire. That's L-I-T-Z. And um, so a lot of guys use nichrome wire or another wire that's meant to be very good as well. It's a wire called uh, Rene 41. That's R-E-N-E 41 wire. So some guys have been use, use that as well and have good results with that. I have used guitar strings in the past as well uh, when my son used to live at home with his guitars his disc discarded guitar strings um i used to i've tried them as well and, and they do work but you, you need to put a fair another question i got in the comments recently was uh, a guy contacted me saying he's having problems with the calibration and these uh, des designs are coming out a lot smaller than the than they should be well, there's a few things to check on that um, so, so in part four of the video series where I showed you how to do the calibration I said that although you could set the settings in the um, settings page for the steps per inch it wouldn't save them but um, a guy called Jan and I think he was from Czechoslovakia alerted me to um, a setting in the uh, Arduino code and the uh, 
by changing that it will save the settings so i'll just show you that now on the, on the next bit where you can do that connect to there we go to the settings page the settings there dollars zero to dollar three is where we can change the steps per inch now when i first put this together you could change the settings here and it would accept the changes but as soon as as soon as you uh, shut the program down and restarted the Arduino, it lost them. And uh, and what, what I said to people then is, well, once you've worked out your settings, go into the Arduino and put them in. But there is another, another way to do this. So what we need to do, if we go into the Arduino, and it's in config H, and if we just go down a little bit, at line 49 there and it says that the default is to always upload the default parameters and that was set to one so by changing it to zero what will happen then is it will actually keep the settings then so we'll just just prove that to you and i i have uploaded this uh, change firmware up onto the website so if you've downloaded it fairly recently you should have this change in so the way to check I thought we got a motorbike running somewhere. I'll have to have a look at that. <laughs> so if we change this to say a thousand, and the other thing to do is you can see there's a little mark in there. Make sure you hit enter. And it keeps it then. So if we now uh, come back and disconnect, from the other I'll close the program down and I'll even unplug the Arduino plug it back in if we go back in and connect and we go to settings there and you see it still retained the settings so all it is is that little line there so you can either do that yourself if you've got if you downloaded the software previously or the latest version has got it in so I'll just put that back to what it was hit enter and now that's stored on the Arduino so that helps a bit when we're doing the calibration uh, which we'll come on to in a little bit as well so that makes it a bit easier for when you're trying out your settings so the other thing as well, if you find that it's not coming out, um, even though you've done the calibration and your wing is coming out smaller, the other thing to check is to make is the amount of current you're putting through the wire. Now, if, if your wire's going through the foam and it's you can see a massive uh, gap around the wire, which is called the curve value, and I'll put a little picture up to show you what I mean by that probably got too much current in the wire so the wire just needs to be hot enough to go through the foam to cut it without dragging now if you've got too much current on there what it's going to do it's going to burn too much away and that's that's probably why you're getting um, it coming out a lot smaller the other reason you can get um, the wing to come out smaller is to do uh, on swept wings so let me just get one of these wings off as well so if you're doing a swept wing where you actually place the the wing in the, the foam makes a big difference so if you place it right across there it's not going to come out the right size and if you place it right across there it's not going to come out the right size so within the, the foam cutting software it will normally tell you where to play, place it and the, I'll put a picture up on on uh, dead wing foam where, you, where you're doing swept wings and it gives you the details of where to put the wing so if you're doing it too far that way or too far that way you can imagine as it's coming out like a triangle there you, you're going to be getting a different portion of the triangle so if you're doing a straight wing and it's coming out far too small the reason for that is probably to do with the amount of current you're putting through the wire you may be putting too much in there and melting too much away 
And what you'll find as well is if you do put too much current through there on the wing itself, and you can see it on this wing as well. This is when I was just um, testing the foam out. You can you can see that it's, the wire's actually been too hot and it's actually, you can see on the edge there, it's melted a bit away there and it feels a lot rougher. Whereas on, on this wing, wing here, it feels smoother. So what it tends to do is it almost, almost like sort of crystallizes the foam and it feels quite hard then. So that's another reason not to use too much, too much current. You'll get a lot better finish on your wing. So I hope that's covered the uh, calibration issues and if you, things are not coming out the size you, you expected. One question I get quite a lot as well is um, guys will say to me, will these stepper motors be okay? And uh, they'll send me some details of the stepper motors. And as long as you can send me some details, I can tell you whether it's going to be okay with this, this design. The main thing to look for is the amount of current that the the motor's going to take and uh, as you can see here I've got some bigger motors laid out um, so one of the questions I get is can I use NEMA 23s and generally you can't because the NEMA 23s generally run on a lot more current than the the ramps board with these little drivers can handle so if you look at this this is a driver for a NEMA 23 uh, stepper motor so if you look at the difference in the so th this particular driver is designed to handle about three and a half amps whereas these at most will handle two amps you know at a push <laughs> so if you do want to use NEMA 23s and the only reason I would say to use them is if you've already got them um, because the price of these little NEMA 17s now, um, and with a ramp spore and that, you know, it's uh, it, it doesn't make economic sense to uh, go and buy these NEMA 23s. This this particular design of foam cutter doesn't need big motors. Uh, it works absolutely fine on these, and that they're more powerful than you think. Um, I've actually ruined some of these couplers here before I got limit switches on and, uh, and it drove itself against these the stops and uh, it just pulled the thing apart and you know be surprised how much power these little little motors have got in them so don't think you need big motors to make it work faster or or better the only reason I would say to use NEMA 23s if you've already got a bunch of them kicking around and you've got some of these drivers already uh, and you can connect them up to the um, ramps board and in fact you don't even need to connect them up to the ramps board you can connect them directly to the Arduino um, so all you need to do is uh, find the relevant pin outs and, uh, and just, just plug them into there because all the connections on the Arduino uh, with the control software on there all the pens are defined so yeah it would be a little bit of wiring with all this uh, and as you can see there I've done I've done one there so I've wired that up and I had that connected up uh, as you'll see in another part of the video where we do uh, check in the directions and the uh, and I had that plugged into the um, into the actual ramps board without the, the driver on and, and it worked absolutely fine so you can't plug NEMA 23s directly into the ramps board but if you use one of these drivers and the NEMA 23s and these drivers are designed to work on 24 volts well actually they can actually go to 36 volts as well so you need a different power supply and if you want to instead of using the control software that we've got here um, you can use uh, Mac 3 or Linux CNC and just connect these up with the old parallel port but you will need a computer uh, with a parallel port now for Mac, for Mac 3 you can use USB you can get the USB version although this has got a USB on here it isn't a USB you can connect 
all that USB does is provide power for this little board. Uh, it's not a USB connection. And so if you've got an old um, desktop kicking around, you can plug uh, you can plug this in and a Mac 3 um, will work absolutely fine on an old desktop. I've still got my um, Mac 3 running on Windows XP and uh, it's not connected to the internet or anything and it runs absolutely fine. And Linux CNC runs absolutely fine on this setup. Linux CNC you can't use USB so uh, so you, you're limited to the parallel port but I bet if you ask around some people have got some old desktops kicking around which will be absolutely fine. And if you've got these motors anyway it's fairly cheap. These these particular drivers, when I last checked, these are around about fifteen pounds or about twenty dollars each. So you'll need four of them. Uh, I think these are only a these are only a few dollars, about seven or eight dollars. And so if you've got an old desktop kicking around and you've got some NEMA twenty threes on another machine, um, then that might be a good option. The other thing to consider as well. If you're like I did, I started off doing phone cutting, and then once I got phone cutting, I thought, "Oh, I fancy having to go at CNC routing." Then, so uh, I got myself a CNC router, and I put some. Uh, I've done quite a few videos on the CNC router as well. And on the controller I was using, this is a spare controller here. This this setup here. And on the controller I was using, I could flip it between phone cutting and uh, doing routing. So if you think you might want to be doing some CNC routing as well, then going the NEMA 23 route might be a good option. And this design will work with NEMA 23s, just as you'll have to use either Linux CNC or Mac 3. So in the plans for this design, there is uh, there's templates to cut for cutting out for uh, NEMA 23s instead of NEMA 17s. So yes, you can use NEMA 23s, but not not with the ramps board in the configure the normal configuration. So again, if if if, if you do have any uh, questions on stepper motors, um, you know will these be all right? Just check the current first. Generally, anything under about 1.5. 1.2 amps works best with this design. You don't. The more powerful motor you get, it's going to cost you more, and you, it's not going to work any better. And these are only 0.9 of an amp, and they work absolutely fine. So, you know, save yourself some money and get some uh, cheaper motors. But if you do have any questions on stepper motors, I've got a link on the website where I answer a load of questions, and I'll put that in. And then if you're still not sure, just drop me an email or comment, and I'll do my best to answer them. So I hope that's answered questions on stepper motors, guys. Another common question I get is what type of phone do I use? And basically I've only used two types of phone. Um, the phone I generally use most of the time now is just the, the plain old white foam or in this case black foam. Um, normal polystyrene that you can get at most DIY stores. Um, it's extremely light and you know if you're building wings so these are some spare wings for, for this one so uh, once you put some carbon rod in so this has got some carbon rod in and uh, it's been covered in my favorite co covering method brown paper um, it's incredibly strong you know you can I mean you, you could break it but it you know it takes some doing so uh, and it's it's light as well so uh, I tend to use just white foam now, or black foam in this case, depending on what colour you can get. But I have used, in the past as well, I have used um, this pink foam, XPS foam. Um, but what I'm finding with that now is uh, it's a little bit more difficult to get hold of. But also, it rubs down quite well, but I find the particles now are uh, giving me some uh, issues. Um, I do have a bit of sinus problems and that, and uh, you know, problems with my nose, so uh, I don't use this very often now. I've just got a few odd bits left around for where I need to uh, somewhere where it's a little bit stronger, so uh, yeah, so um, 
I don't tend to use that anymore and all my bills now will be with um, you know the, the, the polystyrene type foam. The other type of foam that people ask me questions about is uh, EPP. You know, it's, it's quite um, flexible, that type of foam. Um, I haven't ever used it on the foam cutter just because I've never been able to get hold of, you know, any of it at a reasonable price. So um, people do use it. And I, you know, understand that you can, it cuts quite well on the foam cutter, but personally, I haven't used it. So, uh, so that's the types of foam I use. And um, and all my bills now will be with the, with the white foam. So I've got a few more bills planned. So, uh, you know, keep a look out for them. A couple of interesting ones coming up in the future as well. Right, another question I've had a few times now, uh, people have come to me and said, can I use the Arduino uh, Uno, which is this little, little device here. So as you can see, it's, it's very similar to the, uh, to the Mega, but it's just a lot smaller. And yes, you can use the Uno, but the software that's on the website, it won't work with it, uh, the firmware. But you can use it with Dev CNC foam. Um, Dev CNC foam will work with quite a few different controllers and even some of the, the later duos, the 32-bit controllers as well. So, uh, you know, Dev CNC foam is is what I use now uh, all the time. I still um, use the the free one uh, mainly for testing purposes as well, but. Um, if you want to use the Uno, Uno uh, there's normally a thing that you can get with it called the CNC shield, but I think you are a little bit limited as well if you want to run limit switches. I, th I think it'll only work on two axes on Dev CNC foam. So yes, you can use the Uno, um, but for the price of these now, um, I'd probably just go and get the Mega. You know, there's, there's not much difference in price. Uh, but yeah, a few guys have had the the Uno with a CNC shield, but you need to use the uh, Dev CNC foam firmware, which is, I think I've said before, uh, it costs about 60 euros. So uh, yeah, it's possible. And another question I get is, can I use um, lead screws instead of the threaded rod? And yeah, if you have a look on the website, I've got a builder's gallery there and quite a few of the guys have decided to use lead screws instead of um, and instead of the threaded rods. So they are a bit more expensive, um, but they're probably a little bit more precise. But remember these things, they're cutting fine. They don't need to be that precise. You know, uh, I mean, I've, I've printed off drawings that of fuselages that I've done with the foam cutter, and then I've laid the parts over on the drawings and they line up perfectly to the eye. So, you know, don't get too hung up on the hardware. You, you need super accurate hardware for a foam cutter. You need, to, you need it to work well, but it doesn't have to be, you know, thousandths of an inch perfect. And I have put a, a link on uh, in the website for the uh, sizes you need if you do want to use lead screws. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, quite possible to use lead screws. And as I said, have a look on the builder's gallery and there's a, there's a few guys there that have actually used them there and the, there's some awesome looking machines on there. Some with a lot of 3D printed parts on as well. At the moment, the software you download from the website doesn't support limit switches. So if you do want to use limit switches on an Arduino based foam cutter, then the only option you've got at the moment is Dev CNC foam and that works really well. So that's what this next section is about. I am looking into putting some upgraded firmware on the controller. So stick around to the end of the video and I'll explain what I'm doing with that. So one of the reasons I wanted to try Dev uh, CNC foam was because it supports limit switches and it supports the G93 feed rate mode. And it's specifically designed for four axis foam cutting. And it's uh, 60 euros for the uh, firmware, which I think is quite reasonable really when you consider what it's doing. You know, if you compare that against Mac 3, which is $175, then it looks, looks at a bargain. But there, there are three options you can use. There's the one on the website, and then there's Linux CNC as well. Um, but I got it wired in, and I made uh, some brackets for the switches. And the switches are behind 
the axis is there and then on the bases as, as well. I'll show you some better pictures of them in a, in a bit. So I got it all wired in um, and used some twin core cable and then once I got it all ready I started testing and I came across an issue that um, I thought possibly might happen but uh, I'll just show you what it is. So what we do on Dev's CNC foam is to calibrate the origin and that goes up to the limit switches and then comes back off them and it's set to come 10 millimeters off. Uh, you, you can alter that in the settings there. I'll put some pictures up of this so you can see it a bit better. So if we run calibration, everything starts off okay. So the two axes are working fine, horizontal axes. And it does it twice. And you can see what's happening now is on the vertical axis, they seem to be a bit out of sync. And only what's called the XR axis in Death Seems in Phone, this axis seems to be working properly. And all that happens on the on the Y uh, axis, it just keeps going, uh, just keeps going up. <laughs> is it what? No, it's a YL axis. This one, Dev CNC refers to this as a YL, and it doesn't uh, home properly. It's puzzled me for quite a bit, and I, I've tried one of two things. And what it turns out to be is that the cable isn't shielded. And I think if you can, uh, what I've done with the cables, I've just used some twin core cable and taped it alongside the, the actual stepper motor wires. And I think what's happening is there's some back EMF being induced from the motors and triggering the, the switches and causing it to do all sorts of funny things. So um, I was quite surprised. I have run a test with a bit of a shielded cable on, uh, which wasn't long enough, so I had to drape it across and it worked perfectly. So what we'll do, we'll get it, get some shielded cable on and show you it working properly. But that's something to bear in mind, guys, with any CNC machine using limit switches, make, make sure you shield, shielded cables. So I've replaced all the wires on the foam cutter for the limit switches, and I got hold of some of this twin core with, with a screen around the outside, so you can, oh, you can just see, I'll hold it up there. It's a screen cable there. So rather than just place the one that was playing up, which was his Z-axis, I've replaced them all. So I've got about 10 metres and I think I've used about 6 metres. So all the limit switches have been wired in with this now and they all go back to the uh, Arduino. And what I've done is I've grounded the screen end on the uh, ground of the Arduino. And, and on some, and all the tests I've run, it's worked okay. So to get the limit switches on, there we go, so they fit on there. And all I've done is put a little bit of hot glue just to hold them on there so they can come off easy enough. And then I've wired them. They've all been wired up in normally connected. So what happens if there's a break anywhere, it would just stop. You can do them normally open, but it's generally not recommended as a, as a good option uh, to do that. So these are on the x-axis and the similar setup on the um, the vertical axis there uh, I'll put a picture up of the switches uh, and the bracket and uh, so I just designed them in Fusion 360 and then printed them out so we'll just show you it working now and then to actually home the axis what we do is we do calibrate origin down here so if I run the calibrate origin then you'll see what happens and we get this screen come up here and ask us how far we want it to come off the, uh, the limit switches. So it's by default it's set at 10 mil and I've left it there. And there's another couple of options there which uh, I haven't needed to use. So it seems to work perfectly now. So if we run it now. So it does it twice on each axis.
they are, I can see it works perfectly now. So lesson learned, um, always use shield, shielded cable for limit switches. So thanks very much for watching guys, if you made it this far into the video. I hope it's answered all your questions and helped you with any troubleshooting problems you're having, you know, getting the machine to work. As I said, if it's still, still having problems, just drop me a, an email or a, a comment and, uh, in YouTube and I'll, I'll have a look and I'll do my best to get you going. So, so far I've got a 100% record of all the guys that have contacted me. So hopefully we can maintain that and uh, help you out if, 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 you have, if you're struggling. So we're nearly at 2,000 subscribers. I'm quite amazed really that an old man messing around in foam like me can get 2,000 people that are interested in what he's doing. But um, it's a bit of a niche area, uh, foam cutting, and I do do other things. As you can see on the bench here, this is a, an F-18 that I'm building at the moment. Uh, F-18's always been one of my favorite jets. I don't know why, there's just some planes, you, when you look at them, they just do it for you. And the F-18 is one, one of them. So. Uh, this is from FRC Foamy, so I've uh, I printed the plan off and then cut all the parts out of uh, Depron. So I think this is going to be a real blast to fly as well, as I've got a really fast motor to go in it as well. So keep a look out for that. I'm also looking at trying to get some updated firmware to run on the controller. Uh, the, it's running on quite old uh, garble firmware, uh, it's version 8, and it's up to version 1.1 now. So I'm looking into that because there's a few limitations with the firmware. Uh, it doesn't support G93 and you, you can't use limit switches on there. So uh, I've got the source code for the um, controller program. The firmware isn't the problem, it's the controller program displaying the, uh, the results from the uh, controller. So I've got the source code and I've been looking at it and I think I might be able to do something with it. I can't promise anything, so I will have a look at it, but I have got a friend that's a uh, developer and so uh, I've, I even contacted him already about something to do with it and he's, he's helped me out so if it looks successful I'll probably just test it a bit first and then hopefully we can uh, I can pass it on to you and, uh, and give you a little bit more functionality with the with the controller for uh, you know for free <laughs> so once again thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you in the next one